which I have my son-in-law, Dennis Giddings, with me. Dennis, hold your hand up so they know who you are. And this is Michael Adams of our staff. Uh, Michael has got his MBA, and he's all but just uh, finished with his earned doctorate and his law degree. Amen. And has been just a fervent servant in our ministry. I don't know of anybody with more of a servant's heart than Michael Adams. And uh, he said, this is why God gave me these abilities, is to serve the churches. So I pray for these men. I appreciate you letting me. I'm sorry to have to have Michael help me up here. Uh, just a while back, I broke two bones in my one leg. And uh, on a morning like this, they really talk to me when it gets a little damp outside. And uh, here's the dilemma. I was walking across the front of a church, and I tripped on a little riser they had there. And so here I am, a lawyer with broken bones and nobody to sue, okay? So it's a real dilemma and an aggravation. I want to talk to you about something I've preached on a great, great deal, but it's absolutely critical. It always has been, but now even more so than ever before. Have you got power in your prayer life? Not do you believe in prayer. I don't ever go anywhere that the people say, oh, no, I, I wasn't aware we're supposed to pray. I didn't know that. We all believe in prayer. But the question is, if we had to get a hold of God this morning, if we had to get something essential from God, have you got power in your prayer life? I was in a third world country. You're going to hear... Dr. John Honeycutt later today, dear, dear man of God, I've known him for decades and you're going to be blessed today. But a very impoverished group of people came across a border to the meeting. And they said, it must be hard for you to pray in America because you don't need anything. They said, you understand, we don't pray, we don't eat. We don't pray our kids starve in our arms. We don't pray we get massacred. But you don't have any needs. Must be hard for you to pray. And they didn't say it unkindly, John, but it just struck my heart. The reason that I started preaching on prayer so much is I was dissatisfied with my own prayer life. Now, I would pray, and when nothing happened, it didn't surprise me. I wasn't shocked. And I always just kind of passed it off. I said, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe I just didn't do it right, or somehow it wasn't the Lord's will. But I'd read all these verses in the Bible on prayer, you know, asking prayer, believing, and you shall res and I thought, God, I, I don't have power in my prayer life. And then I met some people who did. So I want to ask you, I promise you, God wants to answer your prayer more than you want it answered. But we're going to look at four keys found in this passage of Scripture that are essential for power in prayer. Now, whenever you read the book of James, I always caution people, remember two things. This was written by the half-brother to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? He grew up in the home with Jesus. He saw Jesus as a young man, as a teenager. That'd be a tough home to grow up in. Mary had to say on occasion, why can't you be like your brother Jesus? I mean, <laughs> poor guy. But God now, using him dramatically, heading the church in Jerusalem, he's writing to people who are suffering incredible adversity. If you read verse 1 in chapter 1, he's writing to the Christians who are scattered because unbelievable times have come that they never could imagine. Now, my prayer is we're not going to see this in America. But right now, I'm watching things in America I never dreamed we'd see. And if you'd listen to our phone one day, 
We get just in over 100 to 125,000 calls a year. And if you'd listen to one day, you'd say, my goodness, what in the world is going on? I'm litigating things I didn't think my grandchildren would ever see. And now I'm the lawyer for them. We better have power in prayer. By the way, how many of you want power in prayer? Amen. James chapter, if you would with me, five. We're going to start at verse 17. James chapter five. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. You understand, one man's prayer unsynced the weather of the universe. Boy, do we have a powerful God. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. I want you to write four things down this morning. I'll not preach long. But these have revolutionized my life, and I pray they'll touch your heart this morning. Four things for power in prayer. Here's the first one. If you want power in prayer, the first thing you got to do is, number one, pray. It's right there in the book. Elijah was a man subject to like passions with Zear. This is not him saying, I'm like you guys. This is God saying he was like you. And he prayed. Whoa. You spend more time on your iPhone than you do in prayer? You spend more time watching Fox News than you do in prayer? Spend more time doing what? You have to pray. Now the Bible says, ask. In faith believing and you shall receive. But the word ask there was the word for asking with specificity. What are you asking for? Specifically. I ask people this all the time when we get in lawsuits. Uh, bring me your prayer list. I want to see your prayer list before we put you on the witness stand. What's on the list? If you're anything like me without a list, your prayer life gets sweepingly general. Without a prayer list, I can pray for 10, 15 minutes, maybe. But I'm, I'm like, oh, Lord, be with my family. Oh, please bless my precious wife and my kids. And God, be with my pastor and our church. And oh, God, the missionaries. And What are you specifically asking for. You know what he says in this book? You have not because you asked not. What are you asking for? Now, I have a list of 62 things I pray for my wife every day. Now there's nothing on that list peculiar to us. Nothing. I've shared the list hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. But I ask for her. What are you asking for? What are you asking for each of your kids? What are you specifically asking God to do in your church? Not just, oh, bless me, help me. How do you want him to bless you? How do you want him to help? How many of you know the name Lester Roloff? You know that name? Great evangelist of yesteryear. We're in the middle of a trial, and I went down to his motel room. It was a little tiny motel room, and there were papers all over both the beds, on the floor between, on the table, on the chair, on the dresser. And I said, Brother Roloff, are these papers for the trial? He said, no, 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 no. I said, what are these papers for? He said, this is my prayer list. I said, this is your prayer list. And he changed my life. Here's what he said. He said, I'm asking God for a lot. He said, how did you, David, get so comfortable asking God for so little? Whoa. 
What would it take to get you to ask? Now, don't read the rest of the passage if you're not going to ask. You say, well, I, I'm just too busy to pray like that. No, you're not. No. Uh, can I tell you right now, if I were to offer you $100,000 for each hour you'd spend in prayer, you'd be amazing the time you'd find to pray. <laughs> God says, my door's never closed. Talk to me. Ask. Oh, that's everything. And, and let me say this respectfully, because there's so many great, precious pastors in this room. A pastor who doesn't have power in prayer is in real trouble. Real trouble. Oh, my. Our office meets in, in dedicated prayer every day. The lawyers are on their faces before God. First thing you've got to do if you want power is you've got to ask. Now, if you don't have a prayer list, please start one. By the way, you'll never stop adding to it. Never. I was cutting across country the other day and picked up a Christian radio station. I don't know the guy's name, but he was just preaching up a storm. Only got him for about 15 minutes. But he said some stuff, and I thought, man, how do I not have that on my prayer list? And immediately I added it. I just know one day when I stand before the Lord, he's going to say, did you not understand I'm all powerful? Did you not understand I said I want you to talk to me about everything? It says in everything by prayer and supplication, with, request, let you, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Why didn't you ask? A child can do it. This doesn't take any great acumen, but it does take dedication. Wow. The first thing you got to do is ask. Write the second thing down. You got to do it earnestly. It's right there in the book. Man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly. Earnestly. When's the last time you got earnest with God? By the way, look, look at the verse just ahead, verse 16. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. This is not a game. Now, you can fool me whether you're fervent or not, but you don't fool God. When is the last time you got before God earnest, <laughs> fervent? Fervent, fervent. Well, Brother Gibbs, I, I'm, I'm just not good at expressing myself that way. You can be fervent and not say a word. Remember Hannah when she went into the temple to pray? You realize what happened? She was so fervent in prayer, they thought she was drunk. And they rebuked her. How dare you come in here inebriated? And she said, I'm not drunk. I'm fervent. Has your maid ever seen you fervent in prayer? Have your kids ever seen you fervent in prayer? Oh, now put us in front of a baseball or a football game with our man, we can get wound up like you can't imagine. But in prayer? Whoa. A dear pastor friend of mine from here in Ohio, Levi Wisner was his name. Some of you might have known him. We were traveling from Ohio to Texas, driving through the night. And we're going down Interstate 55, driving all night. And he said, David, I got a good idea how to spend the night. I said, what's that, preacher? He said, you take the next two hours and pray fervently out loud, and then I'll take the two hours after that. I said, what now? Has anybody ever asked you to pray fervently for two hours? It's not out of, it's nothing unreasonable. I said, two hours, that's a long time. He said, well, David, have you ever prayed fervently out loud to God for two hours? And I said, no. Have you? Fervent. 
He said, well, have you ever prayed fervently out loud for an hour? No, we're the people who believe in prayer. We're the people telling America you're prayerless. We're the people telling Washington you better learn how to pray. Listen, we're not going to change Washington until we change ourselves. And by the way, the next election is not the hope of America. The hope of America is the gospel in the local church. That's the hope of America. I said, no, I've never prayed fervently for an hour. Out loud. He said, well, I'll go first. I said, that's a good idea. You go first. <laughs> and he did. Now, I'm driving. We're going down the I-55. I mean, I can take you to the point, and I'm watching him. 10% of the time, I'm looking at the road. 90% of them, the man is talking like he's standing in front of God. He's talking like God's in the car with us. Do you understand who you're in front of when you talk to God? Whew. Did he pray two hours? No, he prayed just a little over three, and it went by like that. When's the last time you got fervent, earnest? Now, this won't happen by accident. You'll never roll out of bed one morning and say, hmm, must have happened in the night? I don't know. <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm a fervent prayer warrior. No, no, no. This is a decision. But we're going nowhere until we pray, we ask, and we're going nowhere until we get fervent, earnest. Well, I'm just too respectful to get fervent. This is not a matter of disrespect. This is a matter of heart and passion. Write number three down. You got to ask. You got to get earnest, fervent. The third thing you got to do is you got to get clean. Look at the verse just ahead. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. A righteous man. When's the last time you got clean? Now listen very carefully. Not cleaner. Clean. Boy, I made this mistake. Pastor House, I went to the altar hundreds of times to get cleaner. I never went to get clean. When's the last time in front of God you got clean? Well, we can't be perfect. No, you're right, but we can get clean. Can I remind you what it says? If we confess our sins, what's the rest of the verse say? He is faithful and just to cleanse us from, what's the next word? All unrighteousness. You got a God who says, I'm in the cleaning business. But you got to get clean. I mentioned Brother Roloff. We were in a trial. Everything was going horrible. And, and he said, uh, boy, be in my room. He had this horrible habit of calling at four in the morning. I'd always say the same thing. I didn't get you up, did I? And I'd say, no, I was just praying here waiting for you to call. <laughs> four in the morning is not my stick. Now, you want to go four in the morning where we stayed up. That's, I can do that with you, but boy, that getting up at four. He said, be down to my room. We're going to pray. I walked in his room and he said, we got a judge that hates me. I said, that's true. He said, there's a dozen lawyers on the other side and all I got is you one. I said, that's true. He said, the jury keeps shaking their head at us. He said, we're, we're getting killed. I said, I agree with all that. He said, well, we're going to get God in this. We're going to fix this. He said, you believe God can fix it? I said, yeah. He said, well, here's what we got to do. He said, we're going to pray, but it don't do any good to pray if you're not clean. Uh, I want you to look at a verse. Just flip over in 1 Peter. Now, there's a bunch I could quote, but this one is close by. 1 Peter chapter 3, 
verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. Now remember, this is written to believers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. I wonder how many prayers I've prayed. I'm saved, I'm heaven bound, but I wasn't clean. God says, my ears are open if you're righteous. Hmm. Never forget what Brother Olaf said. He said, here's what we're going to do. You go over and get in that corner, I'll get in this one. And he said, don't you come out till you're clean. When's the last time you bowed and got clean? I'm going to tell you what I did. I bowed down and I said, Lord, I don't know how to do this. I want to be clean. But I've never done this. Do you want to be clean? Not cleaner, clean. We're all comfortable with some pet sins. We're all comfortable with things we know break God's heart. But we're very good at controlling them, at keeping them secret-like. I started praying, I said, God, you gotta, I wanna be clean. D.L. Moody used to close almost every one of his services, the great American evangelist, by saying, do not walk out those doors if you're not clean. Because you're going nowhere with God till you are. Hmm. After about an hour and a half, and I mean, I'm listening to him confess sins. He yelled over at me, he said, I don't hear you confessing nothing. <laughs> and all I can think of is you better hope I got a short memory preacher, because, <laughs> wow. God wants you clean. He's promised to clean you. We got up, I'll never forget his prayer. He said, I'll pray. He said, Lord, I want you to get the judge real sick so he can't be our judge, and he has to not be the judge at the trial. And my eyes flew open. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, you're not asking God to kill the judge, are you? He said, oh, no. He said, if God killed him, he'd go straight to hell. I just want him sick. I said, well, add, rephrase this prayer. You're scaring me. <laughs> he said, okay, God, Brother Gibbs is afraid of what I'm praying for. I know you're not, you understand. I just want him where he can't be our judge. And he said, number two, confuse these lawyers. Tie them in knots. Do what you did in the Old Testament where you turn the enemy on each other. He said, you got anything to add, Brother Gibbs? I said, yeah, one more time. We don't want God to kill the judge, okay? <laughs> you scared me. Bottom line, back in court, 8.30. All rise. Mr. Gibbs, you ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Turned to the lead lawyer on the other side. He said, you ready? He said, Your Honor, we got a problem. The judge said, what's the problem, counsel? He said, last night we were in complete agreement on everything, and this morning we can't agree on anything. One of the lawyers spoke up and said, this lawsuit should never been brought. We just brought it to harass this pastor. This lawsuit is baseless. It needs to be dismissed. And the judge's eyes got to be the size of silver dollars. He said, are you out of your mind? The jury's in the box listening. That lawyer said, I, I don't know what happened. But he said, we had this locked down last night, and this morning there's not one of us that can agree to anything. He said, I don't know what happened. Brother Roloff tugged on my sleeve. He said, you want me to stand up and tell him what happened? <laughs> True. I said, no, no. 
This next thing you're going to tell the judges, he better get going to the hospital because he's going to fall over dead if he don't. An hour later, they dismissed everything. Paid all the expenses. People came up, Brother Honeycutt, and hugged my neck and said, you were brilliant. I said, you don't know what you're talking about. I was just a spectator in there. You saw God do something brilliant. You want to see God answer prayer? You got to get specific. Specific. Ask means with detail. You got to get fervent, earnest, and you got to get clean. Write the fourth thing down and we're done. It's in the rest of the story. And he prayed again. Hmm. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now, if you read the story in 1 Kings, you know this is Mount Carmel, where he's just confronted the prophets of Baal. God's answered with fire. And now he wants to bring the rain. But if you read the story, he prays, and nothing happens. He sends his servant out. And the servant goes and looks and comes back and says, I don't know how to tell you this, there's no rain. Now, wait a minute, I thought you were the one prayer wonder. One prayer shut the rain off. One prayer brought the fire down. Now you just prayed and it didn't happen. So he prayed again. He said, go check again. He went out another time, came back, no rain. Prayed a third time. Went out and checked, no rain. Whoa. But he persisted. That's the key. He prayed a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time. And when he prayed a seventh time, the servant went out and said, there's a cloud the size of a man's hand. And Elijah said, you better get out of here. It's going to rain like nothing you've ever seen. What does it take to make you stop? Remember, God's promised to answer. But he loves it when you have faith that he's going to do it. Will you persist in prayer? My mother, when I was eight years old, contracted polio. Revolutionized our home. My mom was the church pianist. We went to every church service. If the doors were open, we were there. And one morning at five in the morning, she's cooking breakfast. And she said, run, get your dad. I think I'm sick. She walked in on the couch and never walked again. Polio had stricken our house. Her body just writhed up and She's gasping for breath. Her hands are violently shaking. The medics came. I'm eight years old. And I watched them punch a hole in my mother's throat the size of a 50 cent piece, trying to save her life. And I heard them tell my dad, we don't think she's gonna make it to the hospital, but we'll try. And I'm standing there thinking, what are you talking about? When they took her out the door, I didn't realize that I wouldn't see my mom for two and a half years. In an iron lung, can't breathe, for two and a half years. Our life hit a wall. I got upset with God. I thought, God, I know people never go to church. They don't have this. We always go, and this is how you treat us. All we lived for was the reports of, did she make it another day? And in those reports, they always said the same thing. She can't breathe, but we can't stop her from praying. Are you Davy? 
Your mom prays for you by the hour. She can't walk, she can't move. She's having immense trouble just breathing. Finally, after two and a half years, my mom got to come home. Strapped in a wheelchair, can't move. First thing my dad did, he said, it's been two and a half years since we had family altar altogether. Let's get together and pray. When my mom prayed, she said three things that just absolutely struck me. She said, number one, God, I want to thank you for this. You realize the Bible commands you in everything to give thanks? Not for what you... When's the last time you honestly thanked God for what you wish weren't there? The second thing she said was, please give me something to do for you. Now, she's strapped in a wheelchair. She can't hold her head up. And she's asking God for something to do. And the third thing she said is, God, I know I'm very damaged goods. But your strength is made perfect in weakness. I got nothing to bring. I can't feed myself. I can't clothe myself. I got nothing to bring you. Have you ever prayed a prayer your kids will never forget? Our pastor came to see us, a very bad meeting. He said, Mrs. Gibbs, the church had a vote. We don't want you folks to come back. We're afraid of the polio. And we voted for you not to be allowed to come back. Literally, I was going to do a career-ending move and punch my pastor in the face. I was. I was up and on my way to do it. I thought, how dare you? And then he finished, he said, she said, Pastor, I understand it's a fearful thing, but pray God gives me something to do. And our pastor said to her, Mrs. Gibbs, you need to realize God's through with you. And you know, I thought, you may be right, but you're not going to say that to my mom in front of me. By the way, God's not through with anybody. I don't care how old you are or what your physical assets or mental access is. Here's the thing. You'll know God's through with you. You'll be looking at him. He left. You know what my mom did? She prayed for him. Prayed every day for God to bless that church. She said, I love that church. Bless him. I never forgot that. Have your kids heard you pray for stuff that hurt you? It's commanded. A new preacher came to town, stopped by us. And he said, I know you've been through a lot. I just come by to pray for you. And my mom said, well, would you pray God give me something to do? I'll never forget this. He got out of his chair and laid flat on our living room carpet. I'd never seen anybody do that. And he starts praying up a storm. Now, God, I don't know what this woman can do, but none of this caught you by surprise. And she's got a heart to serve you, and you never turn that away, God, never. Wow. Halfway through his prayer, he stands up. He says, I got an idea. Now, he says, I have no kids because I have no church. 
But he said, when I do get a church, would you head up to Sunday school? I thought, how do you have a Sunday school when you don't have a church? My mom said, I'd love to. She said, your Sunday school's got two kids in it. I have a boy and a girl. I thought, oh my goodness. I'm doomed to go to church with my sister the rest of my life. <laughs> Little did I know what God was doing. We started. She preached to my sister and I. Strapped up, couldn't hold her head. Tears coming down her cheeks. She taught us a lesson like there were 10,000 kids there. Finally, she said, we got to get more kids. And she said, your granddad used to send the beef trucks out and pick kids up. We need to go get a bus and bring the kids in by a bus. And I said, Mom, we don't have a bus. We have no money for it. This illness has taken everything we have. She said, I know, but there's a big bus company uptown. I want to go get a bus. She said, I'm praying God's going to do it. I said, Mom, I, I just don't think they're going to give you one. She said, we're going to go. I took her uptown. We parked right up against a building there. And when I got my mom out of the car, accidentally I dropped her. We're in the snow. She screamed in pain. I wept. I would never hurt my mother. She shrieked in such agony. She said, you got to hold still. I don't want to pass out. After about 40 minutes on the ground, she said, now, dry my face. I don't want him to see I was crying. And pick me up. I said, Mom, let's go home. She said, no, I've been praying. God's going to do something. Ask in faith. What's the next word? Believing. If you believe, you're going to be taking steps. We went in. My mom said to a little reception girl there, she said, uh, we've just come so you could give us a bus. And she said, well, I, I don't think we do that, but let me get the vice president. And you could hear her on the phone. She said, there's a lady down here that wants you to give her a bus to take kids to church in. And he said, tell her no. And she said, you come down here and tell her she's in a wheelchair. <laughs> Guy came down, he's nice, but just kind of abrupt. He said, look, lady, I hope you get a bus from somebody. It's just not going to be us. And I thought, well, okay, thank you. And my mom said, no, no, don't touch me. She said, I have a question. She said, do you own the buses? He said, no, the owner owns the buses, but I've been here 40 years. My mom said, well, you can't give me the buses. They're not yours. I got to talk to the owner. And he said, he's not coming down here. That little girl that quick picked it up and called the owner. And she said, there's a lady down here who wants to talk to you about giving her a bus. He came right down. He said, lady, let me tell you why I'm down here. You don't know this. When you parked your car, my office is on the second floor window right over your car. I saw you fall. I watched you weep in pain. I watched the agony and I thought, my soul. I've never seen a bus matter to anybody like that. He said, no, I don't think I'm going to give you a bus, but I don't know what to do with you. My mom said, well, I, I just want to tell you this. 
If you don't give me a bus, one day God's going to be awfully upset with you. And I'm like, whoa, mom. (laughs) That man looked at my mom and he said, you're right. He said, here's the deal. If I give you a bus, who'd drive it? You? You got to have your head strapped up. She said, oh, you're right, I got to have a bus and a driver. He said, okay, lady, here's the deal. If you promise me, you'll be sure God knows about this. I'll give you one bus, one driver, one week. And I thought, my soul. And when he said that, my mom said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. My mom said, now, I got one other problem. We really need two buses and two drivers. <laughs> There's two sides of town. He said, okay, two buses, two drivers, one week. And they did only give it one week. Because the second week they gave us four buses. And within three months they were giving us 35 and 40 buses and drivers every week. The Sunday school with no kids never had less than 5,000 children there. Not 500. And it was all because of the prayers of a lady who couldn't dress herself, couldn't feed herself, but his strength is made perfect in weakness. You want power in prayer? You gotta ask. You gotta be fervent. You gotta get clean, not cleaner, clean. And you gotta persist in prayer. I close by telling you, my mom's room was at the base of the stairs in our house. And my bedroom was upstairs and a hundred, hundred nights I'd sit at the top of those steps and listen to my mom pray for me by the hour. When's the last time your kids heard you pray for them? By the hour. Prayer is the most powerful thing in the universe. And God wants to answer your prayers. Bow your heads. Father, oh my. America needs to see some Christians that have a prayer answering God. Heads are bowed. How many of you say, Brother Gibbs, God spoke to my heart? If that's true, hold your hand up right now. Hold them high. If you got your hand up, could I beg you come to this altar for a brief word of prayer? God spoke to my heart. You come. We're going nowhere without prayer. Nowhere. 